Well, last week we left several pages in Unit 32 behind without discussing them. You are encouraged to read them. If you failed to do so, they are self-explanatory. There are comments that will be helpful to you in your study. This week, we will take some time to discuss both the outline of Acts 14 to 28 and also the remarks printed in this section. Look at this diagram and note there is space for you to record the remarks. We will make those remarks at the bottom of that page. Your attention is directed to the word ekoluene or akolutos at the top of the page. It's translated into English unhindered or no man forbidding. Now, this is used one time in the Bible in Acts 28:31. It is, according to some solid Bible expositors, the, key, the whole key to understanding the book of Acts. The illustration shows a very thick eggshell called Israel's Traditions with a little embryo inside named the Christian community. In the same way that a little chick must peck its way out of the eggshell to survive, even so the bride of Christ had to force its way out of the stifling shell of Jewish tradition. Fear, legalism, pride, turf protection, and a hatred of Gentiles was the eggshell. Over and over, as you read the book of Acts, you discover the struggle of the church to free itself from the domination of the religious system into which it was birthed. The final word of Acts tells us with some relief that with the closing of the record, the church had freed itself from this bondage. Tradition always sets its power against new, innovative, fresh, and often spirit-led activities of the body of Christ. On this page, we trace the journey of the first church planters. After a mixed response in Iconium, they moved on to Lycanoia, Lystra, and Derby. These towns were in the heartland of Asia Minor and were fairly close to each other. Note in chapter 14 that the healing of a lame man opened the door for the gospel to be spread. As a result, Barnabas and Paul were considered by the pagan people to be gods. The message delivered to the people was powerful, even if it was short. The record shares how converts were formed into home groups, organized with elders, and how the church planters returned to their home base for their first furlough. This is called the first missionary journey. In chapter 15, we learn Jerusalem began to have concerns about the coming of Gentiles through Paul into the body of Christ. They, they first insisted that all of them should live by Jewish rituals about food and other matters. So a council was called in Jerusalem, and after discussion, it was settled in a way you will want to discover for yourself in verses 1 to 21 of chapter 15. Also, read these comments about it. Ralph Neighbor here, may Christ be revealed in every step you take. As my Chinese friends say when parting, zai qian, zai qian. We need to return to this page and recall that Barnabas and Paul shared differently over letting John Mark accompany them on the second missionary journey. The young man had left them halfway through the first journey. Apparently, 
unable to take the threats of danger they faced in Antioch and Pisidia. As a result, Barnabas set out with John Mark, and Paul joined with Silas to do his work. Thus, the doubling of missionary outreach took place. Someone has said God can hit many a lick with a crooked stick. Sometimes painful separations end up glorifying God in spite of the circumstances involved. In Derby and Lystra, Paul and Silas found thriving churches. They selected Timothy to accompany them as a church planting intern. After waiting for directions from the Holy Spirit, they traveled to Macedonia to the north and east of Derby. Then there they found no synagogue. In such cases, the Jews of the area would gather near a river for their public worship. In this place, the men met Lydia, a brilliant businesswoman who accepted Christ and opened their home to open her home to them for lodging. After a slave girl was healed, once again the men found themselves in trouble with the political powers and were thrown in prison. Set free by the power of God, the event led to the conversion of the jailer and his entire family. As you read over this page, you see that in this second journey, the men moved from town to town, always making converts and getting into trouble. The men from Antioch and Pisidia had made a career of following our church planters and stirring up hatred against their teachings. In Thessalonica and Berea, they had success and troubles. Finally, in Berea, Paul slipped out of town and left Silas and Timothy to carry on the ministry, and he made his way to, a to Athens, Greece, where chapter 17 gives us powerful insights into the strategy he used to witness to pagan Greeks who worshipped many idols. He then made his way to Corinth, an unusual town. It was located in a narrow point on a long isthmus. Rather than sailing around the isthmus of very dangerous trips, ships offloaded their cargoes on one side, transported them across the land, and reloaded them on the other side for their continued journey. Now you can imagine the sailors who hung around such an area with nothing to do. They would look for women, and Corinth had a pagan religion which required every woman to become a temple prostitute for a period of time each year. To hide their identity, they would shave themselves bald before putting in their time. In this immoral community, Paul worked with two citizens from Rome, Aquila and Priscilla, and founded a body of Christ there. It is to these people that 1st and 2nd Corinthians were written. In Corinth, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, was converted. You can imagine the impact that made. Tomorrow, we'll look at Paul's third missionary journey. Ralph Neighbor here, may Christ be revealed in every step you take. As my Chinese friends say when parting, zai qian, zai qian. Today we're going to look at this chart. You will note that there are two more parts to the story of Paul. His third missionary journey, his stay under house arrest in Rome awaiting a, a trial by Caesar. In chapter 18, verse 22, Paul returns for another brief furlough to his home base in Antioch. When he starts out this time, he has quite a group traveling with him, Timothy, Erastus, Gaius, Aristarchus, and Dr. Luke. 
he went to Ephesus and found the Lord had planted some disciples there who were seeking for the truth about Jesus. With them, he formed another body of Christ, and the major metropolis is impacted by the work of the Holy Spirit through the believers. When God comes to a town, it ruins the devil's business, especially when the major industry is manufacturing idols. Those who are being bankrupted by the turning of their customers to Christ started a riot that inflamed the entire city. Although the issue was calmed down, Paul decided to get out of town and let things cool off. He moves about, visiting Troas and Miletus, doing the work of the Lord. And at this time, he's given a powerful desire to return to Jerusalem in time for the day of Pentecost. Now, you will recall that marked the anniversary of the birth of the church. On the way, he visits on the island of Miletus with the elders from Ephesus close by on the mainland. In chapter 21, Paul is solemnly warned by words of prophecy he should not go to Jerusalem, that he would be in danger if he did. He heard the warnings, but chose to continue even after the warning had been repeated several times. Now, since his mission was to the uttermost parts of the earth, why was he so determined to go in the wrong direction? Read the important comments about this on these pages. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, the apostles and the Christians there were very unhappy to have him around. He was a political liability to them, and they wanted him to leave for fear of persecution from the traditional Jewish establishment. Finally, to make himself more palatable, Paul decided to take an ancient vow, the vow of the Nazarite. You may recall that we studied this in the Old Testament. It was a commitment to serve in the temple even though your heritage did not make you a Levite. While in the temple, Paul was recognized, arrested, and thrown in prison. He preaches to a mob in chapter 22 and is nearly killed. He escapes terrible flogging by announcing he's a Roman citizen. It was illegal to flog a true citizen of the Roman Empire. A com conspiracy to murder him is discovered, and so he's removed to Caesarea, a seaside resort northeast of Jerusalem and a center for Roman government. There he is put into prison until someone in authority would decide what to do with him. We'll pick up this fascinating account tomorrow. Ralph Neighbor here. May Christ be revealed in every step you take. As my Chinese friends say when parting, Zai Qian, Zai Qian. Paul's imprisonment in Caesarea was to be no short matter. He appears before Felix the governor and witnesses boldly to him in chapter 24. The story of how he got the runaround in Caesarea is recorded for you to read. Note the details as outlined for you. After two miserable years, He's brought before a new governor named Agrippa. Paul's legal right as a Roman citizen is to be taken to Rome to appeal his case before Caesar, and this is what he demands. In chapter 27, the account of the sea voyage is given. Note the use of the word we in verse 1. There are several of these comments called the we passages, which clearly tell us that Dr. Luke was his companion on this journey. Under guard, Paul and his party are taken by ship to Crete. As they embark for the west, 
The Lord gives Paul a word of knowledge about the voyage. He prophesies that the ship will be wrecked. The record of this actually taking place begins in verse 14 of chapter 27. Although the ship was destroyed, all 276 passengers were saved and they landed at the island of Malta. There Paul prayed over sick Publius and he was healed. Paul was finally taken to Rome where he was put under house arrest. Another precious two years were spent in this condition at the time. Dr. Luke closes the book. Paul's ministry was cut short by making a decision the Holy Spirit warned him not to make. Now, we must be aware that God never stops us from taking his second best for ourselves. If we choose not to do his perfect bidding, he's still with us. But because Paul ignored the warnings and went to Jerusalem, his ministry didn't end. He still healed, received words of knowledge, and wrote powerful letters while in prison in Rome, which we now call his prison epistles. But in the book of Romans, chapter 1, we have a letter written before all these events happened. From it, we know he intended to pass by Rome on his way to Spain. He had a heart and a clear commission to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, but he had an emotional need to go to, to Jerusalem and seek acceptance from those who were in charge of the mother church. His thorn in the flesh, the Jewish men who pursued and harassed him at every turn, surely influenced his decision to reaffirm his Jewish heritage. Should Paul have done what he did? Who can say? Knowing the powerful life he lived and the anointed books he wrote, who of us are worthy to stand in judgment over him? All we know is that he did what he did, and his ministry halted prematurely. God always gives the best to those who leave the final choices to him, but he is still with us and blesses us and uses us in the ways still possible when we do not follow his best choice for our lives. Think deeply about this, my friend. Every single one of us have the capacity to do what Paul did and make a choice that might cause great problems for ourselves. It's never wrong to be totally obedient. Ralph Neighbor here, may Christ be revealed in every step you take. As my Chinese friends say when parting, zai qian, zai qian. As we come to the close of the book of Acts, we would do well to ask ourselves, what would our world be like if the church today were like the church in the book of Acts? For one thing, it would be so radical that it would frighten the average Christian. Imagine a church where the basic building blocks are small groups that never number more than 15 persons. These believers are committed to build one another up, allowing the presence of Christ to guide them in edifying one another. Imagine these house groups combining citywide meetings for clear Bible teaching and for witness to the unbelievers. Imagine thousands who are all involved in house groups, reaching out group by group to minister God's love and Christ's power to the unconverted. Imagine a church that so penetrates the structures of a society that they become the object of persecution by the powers that be, who cannot tolerate the purity of their way of life. Imagine a body of Christ where the gifted men are determined to equip the men with gifts, where every Christian is flat out for God, and where the primary agenda of every 
life is Christian service. Imagine a church which does not have people who drift in and out for an occasional sermon, but where every person is devout in prayer, powerful in the ministration of spiritual gifts, and totally dedicated to doing the will of God. Imagine a body of Christ that knows no geographical turf, that says the world is our church field, that sends forth its members by faith to evangelize the uttermost parts. Imagine it? No. Read about it in the book of Acts, and then ask yourself the question, if you were part of such a body of Christ, would your life be more focused? Would it bring you greater joy? Would you be blessed by those who minister Christ's love to you weekly, even daily? Would you enjoy living in a community of believers rather than just dropping into a public religious building for your spiritual activity? The book of Acts is a very, very dangerous book for our generations to read. It flawlessly reveals what God intended for the body of Christ to be like. In every place where today's church cannot measure up to this standard, it stands as a symbol of God's second best in a world of people who no longer desire His best. A Chinese proverb says, never ask a fish what water is like. Do you get the point? When we accept the reality of church life in the way it has been handed down to us through the centuries, through layers and layers of tradition that do not come from the clear teachings of the pure gospel in the pure church pictured for us in, the, in Acts, we have become the goldfish in the bowl. We accept the church as it is, as the water we're to swim in. But it doesn't have to be the way it is. The church can be the New Testament church. The people of God can live together in love, in small groups, ministering to one another and penetrating with their neighbors with the message of redemption. It is taking place in our world today. Such churches do exist. I want to be a part of such a church until the day the Lord calls me home. I pray you will want to also. Ralph Neighbor here. May Christ be revealed in every step you take. As my Chinese friends say when parting, Zai Qian, Zai Qian.